Uh, participation will be via the chat box, so if you've got questions, please go ahead and enter those into the chat box as we move forward, and we'll answer them as we go. I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Nancy Franz, Associate Dean for Extension and Outreach and Director of ISU Extension and Outreach to Families. Dr. Franz has been with uh, Iowa State University for a while and has been a, uh, an, an outreach professional for over 30 years. And she has published in a number of uh, referee journal articles along the way and is going to share some of that information with us today. Her current research focuses on conditions that promote transformative learning, including the public value of university-based engagement efforts. And with that, I'll turn it over to Nancy. Go ahead. Great. Are you hearing me fine at this point? Nancy, you cut out. Are you yep. hearing me okay now? Okay, great, good. Well, hello everyone. Uh, as was mentioned, I have a variety of experiences uh, with extension and outreach work, and we'll share some of that with you today. Uh, wanted to uh, go ahead and, and just tell you what's up, and look forward to getting your uh, comments in the chat box at any time. You don't need to wait until the end of the presentation. So first of all, as Scott had mentioned, I've been with Extension for over 30 years at five different land-grant universities, and I've always had a 100% Extension faculty tenure line appointment at all of those locations. But I've worked with a wide variety of staff uh, and staffing appointments. I've had a number of positions, everything from a 4-H agent to a regional specialist and a state specialist and um, an administrator, a graduate student, a volunteer, and I see by some of the people who are online right now, many of you are very aware of my work in Extension, and it's good to see some friends online. Uh, I've been lucky enough to be in a variety of academic departments throughout the years, everything from human development uh, to ag and extension education to youth development and to just good old, uh, now I'm in the School of Education. So I have a variety of experiences with different academic departments. I've also been chair of promotion and tenure committees uh, and a member at all levels. So I've uh, been a member at the department level, at the college level, and at the provost level. I've been involved in all of those. I have, uh, for the last uh, number of years, I can't even remember how long, I've been a reviewer for dossiers for tenure and promotion. Uh, as an external reviewer as well as internal, I'm getting ready to do our college internal reviews here at this point. I've also been lucky enough over the years to be deeply involved with a wide variety of publications uh, as a reviewer, uh, serving on editorial boards. I've published in over 30 journals uh, and other types of publications over the years. And so I'd love to know just a little bit uh, personal about me. I enjoy silent sports. A friend of mine wanted to know if a silent sport is if you're golfing. Uh, and you swear, uh, does that mean it's a silent sport? And I told him, well, of course, if nobody else hears you, it's a silent sport. But the definition of silent sports in general is when you are self-propelled, uh, so uh, biking and skiing and canoeing and, and walking and hiking and those kinds of things. And I also love reading and gardening and dark chocolate. And those of you online who do know me, you could probably add other things in there as well. So why is it important to talk about engaged research and, and being published uh, for your engaged research? I noticed um, a number of kinds of engaged research over the years that I've been using uh, and things that I've been noticing. Community-based research, CBR, uh, has become very popular. Um, and more recently in the medical uh, areas, I was just on the phone with a coworker from the University of Iowa this morning talking about community-based research and she's in the Department of Public Health. And so we're seeing a lot of it coming across the waves these days as an appropriate way to do research based in communities. Um, I personally have watched that grow over the last decade where community-based research or action research um, has been kind of seen as the bastard child in research because uh, it's not necessarily seen as controlled as some other methods. But it is gaining traction and I'm pleased to see that. So it comes under a variety of names. You may see it as community-based research, participatory research, 
single case participatory research that's actually a term that was coined by a research team that I was a part of where there's one individual really engaged in the participatory part who uh, connected our research team with community. Action research, which you know came from Cornell a long time ago, those are a variety of names. Uh, but I've really seen that one of the benefits of engaged research is the growth of the scholar, of those of us who are doing the research, our own personal growth and development as we learn in and with communities and community partners. Uh, I also think it's most important of all to do engaged research to really address the social, economic, and environmental issues uh, that are in the world today uh, to really, as my last uh, point says there to make a difference in the world, not just be doing research because we got funded to do it or because we were told to do it or it looks good on our dossier, but to actually try to make a dent in the complex problems in today's world. So here is um, a matrix that I have and used over the years, uh, and this will test those of you who aren't good at real close up vision, but uh, this will be your eye test. Uh, that I've used to make sense out of what does this engaged scholarship look like that we are trying to publish uh, or engaged research. And on the lower left hand side there, uh, oftentimes it's service. Oh, thank you for increasing the size, that is helpful. Um, on the lower left hand side there are the two criteria of engagement and scholarship. When you're low on engagement and low on scholarship, uh, you really are simply doing service. It is a one-way expert presentation to groups. Uh, so you're called up to Kiwanis or Rotary or JCs or whatever it is to just give a talk. Uh, it might be internal committees. You've been asked to serve on the University Budget Committee or your College Committee for Awards and Recognition. It's, uh, or professional associations. Some of us who are online uh, today are part of the American Evaluation Association and we've served in leadership roles there. That's been more service to our profession or service to scholarship or service to engagement than it really is engaged scholarship. So I would suggest that sometimes those roles do help us meet and greet and be with each other to build some research teams to work on engaged research. Uh, if you go in the lower right hand corner, there's scholarship. And scholarship is defined in most of the literature by three criteria. One, it's intellectual work. It's communicated um, to others and it's validated by peers. And so oftentimes you will see uh, journals or um, conference uh, presentations, selection processes calling for a double blind review uh, where the, the peers don't know each other who's doing the review, they don't know who they're reviewing, and the reviewer um, doesn't know who's reviewing them as part of a considered a high peer review process. So you have scholarship in the upper left hand corner uh, is engagement. And that is when we are working with communities and in communities uh, or with businesses or other partners, we're engaging with them for mutual benefit. Uh, there are things that are, are working well for both parties. It is an exchange of knowledge and resources. It's not just a one way uh, sharing of again, is mutual and it's a reciprocal partnership. Uh, there is a shared power, shared resources, shared information. And so you can be engaged, uh, but you may not necessarily be scholarly. And you may have scholarship, but not necessarily be engaged. And so in this upper right hand corner is what I call engaged scholarship. This is when you take the principles of engagement that are to the left and the principles of scholarship directly below and you combine those. And so you may be, for example, be working in a community on a planning process where you're going to come up with an economic development plan uh, for a community. You're engaged with that community, you're conducting community forums, you're exchanging information back and forth about the community and planning processes. So you have strong engagement. Do you also have scholarship principles? Are you creating some new um, knowledge, are you developing someone else's knowledge, or are you disseminating it in a new way? I consider those the three Ds of scholarship, the um, discovery, development, and dissemination. Uh, are you doing that in some original ways? Are you doing it with community members or partners uh, and communicating it with others in a way that is validated by peers? And I will talk more later about some options for that. But if you are combining those two, you are probably doing engaged scholarship that you can report on uh, for your research.
So now I'm going to move into um, another diagram that I created as a um, request from a number of people that I had worked with at the National Outreach Scholarship Conference. They asked me to take my thinking of a model and put it down. And so you can see at the center of the model, my definition of engaged scholarship uh, is academic and mutual community legacy that grows the field, whatever the field is, if it's community development, if it's planning, if it's an evaluation, whatever it might be. But there's that definition again of engagement in the center there. And then there are six opportunities from this definition or this position that you are in working with communities as an academic or a scholar where you can actually create uh, your scholarly leverage points. And so I mentioned three of them with the previous slide. There's discovering knowledge, there's developing that knowledge or someone else's knowledge, and then there's disseminating that knowledge out to in a variety of ways. Or it may then switch into the actual work with individuals and from that knowledge helping them learn something new so that there's learning change, whether that's personal learning or group learning, uh, maybe it's team learning and you actually see people learning something. And then it could also be behavior change where as a result of learning something, people or teams or organizations or businesses or communities actually change their behavior. Or finally, the ultimum that we're looking for is a condition change. How can we talk about the actual changes in social, economic, and environmental changes that we see uh, that we've actually helped create through our research, our engaged research. And so those are six entry points that I find are very helpful for me when I wish to publish or share the work that I'm doing. And so I don't wait to get all the way around those six points if you think of that as being a process, which I find is anything but a linear process, especially when working with people. You may want to um, share what you're getting in the discovery process only. And sometimes I'm specifically talking about just the methodology that I use in the discovery method is sometimes very interesting, working with a community member. For example, I have an article that I hope to work on uh, before the end of this calendar year about a uh, type of steering committee that I use with graduate students to help them more fully engage with communities and uh, get more authentic data, more community-based situation. And I'm hoping to publish that in a very applied journal that's really a methodology that I have developed over the years. And then so outside those six kind of leverage points or ways you can um, think about uh, kind of stages you're in for when you might publish something is which realm you might publish it in. Is it in the research mission realm? Is it in the teaching mission realm? Or is it in the outreach or extension or engagement mission realm? And so uh, with this article that I want to talk about related to um, this uh, graduate steering committee, I've been trying to decide whether or not that's in the outreach realm or is it in the research realm. And I've been going back and forth, and I haven't yet found a research journal that I think is really open to that kind of conversation. Uh, and so I'm really looking at an outreach journal. But it's possible that at some point it may belong in the research realm. And then finally, in this outer ring of my model for engaged scholarship, our internal and external factors and, and engagement assumptions, for those of you who work with familiar, there are these things impacting all these internal rings that you can also use as opportunities to write about or publish about or create scholarship on. The internal and external factors in the outreach environment when you're trying to create conditions could be one combination. Or the assumptions that people have around funding the teaching environment when you're trying to come up with learning change in communities. You can take any of these combinations and use them as a way to think about what you might actually uh, publish about or research about. I see here Dave has asked, what does J-H-E-O-E -E stand for? Uh, very good. I'm going to get to that later, but I'll be glad to share that now. That is the Journal of Higher Education, Outreach, and Engagement. And again, the Journal of Higher Education Outreach and Engagement. And that's uh, actually what I consider the prime outreach and engagement journal. If you're looking for the, the uh, most um, uh, choosy one, if you need to know what it would be the highest, they have a 9% acceptance rate right now. And so I really consider them to be a prime uh, journal for our outreach and engagement work. So let me tell you a little bit now that you've had kind of that um, that basis of the way that I think about engagement and publishing, 
Here's a list of 25 engagement journals, and you can go to this link, and you can actually see these journals. And why I choose this list over other lists, there are many others, but I choose this one because this one is sponsored by the Engagement Scholarship Consortium. And that is a group of 21 universities, 21 institutions of higher education that have come together to actually fund two journals. They fund J-H-E-O-E, and the other one that they uh, fund is J-C-E-S, and that one is the Journal of Community Engagement and Scholarship. Um, that's out of the University of Alabama. J-H-E-O-E is out of the University of Georgia. Both of them are able to be um, online open source journals because the consortium sponsors them. And so I encourage you to go to this list of theirs and see what else they have. Uh, the other reason that I've chosen this list is because they promote the Journal of Extension, and many of you may be uh, interested in that. Uh, there are a couple of us online today who are on the editorial board uh, and the board of directors for that journal. Our extension systems pay for that journal through um, um, a subscription fee in order to make it available to all uh, scholars, emerging scholars, and practitioners and community members. Uh, and you can find that at www dot j o e dot o r g and i suggest that you think about journal of extension as a place for uh, a home for publishing your research uh, we currently have an acceptance rate at 28 percent which i think is extremely good uh, for our publication and we have a variety of different types of manuscripts you can submit everything from a tools of the trade to a research and brief or a commentary and I, I've got about, I think, about between 15 and 20 articles in that journal right now uh, and really enjoy being able to tell stories about the work that we've been doing. So I suggest you go to this link as well as the Journal of Extension. Uh, you will find some there that I think might be new to you that you can look at and really determine whether or not it fits the kind of thing you're interested in publishing. And I truthfully have submitted to some of the, some journals uh, even those that have published me in the past, and they either reject uh, what I've sent them, or they give me a huge set of changes, and I really am not comfortable with, with the rejection. No one's ever comfortable with rejection that I know of, or I'm not comfortable with the changes that they've given me, and I go searching for another journal that I think the article might better fit, and that has been success for me every single time. I've been able to find another journal that has picked up So it really does, uh, the fit really does matter. So what are some steps that you can use uh, in order to make sure that your research, your engaged research, gets published? These are the four steps that I use. They're going to look familiar to lots of folks because they're very similar to research processes. But I use this terminology and find that it works relatively well. And I'll go through each of these steps briefly for you. So first thing to do is to map your efforts. Uh, really thinking about what is the situation of your engaged research? What are the kinds of things that you've been doing in engagement work? Um, why, why is it important? What's really important to doing this work? Why should you do it versus someone else? What are you trying to solve? What issue are you addressing? And then thinking about the inputs, you know, the kind of grant money or the number of people or who's been involved. The actual outputs that are coming out of your effort. Are you creating some new policies and procedures? That are important? Do you have new kinds of uh, community processes that have been developed? Um, what are those outputs, number of people engaged, kinds of people, who are the partners? And then the outcomes were actually the, the learning, the behavior, and the condition changes that you're either seeing already coming out of that engaged work or that you hope that you will see in your work in course. And again, what assumptions do you have about this work that you're doing as engaged research? Uh, is it that funding will come or that you have funding? Are the assumptions that people will be interested in this and want to work with you in a mutual partnership? Uh, are there external factors related to um, the political scene? I know when I'm working with communities, uh, elections make a big difference and policy environments make a huge difference as well as the economy as external factors. So to map your efforts, there are kind of three uh, different methods I use. It depends on who my audience is or what I'm comfortable doing. I oftentimes will simply just write. I will just do text. I will um, list the title of my effort and the situation and the inputs and the outputs, etc., and just write a document that tells that story. Sometimes I will use a concept map. 
Uh, and I tend to use that with audiences that are very visual and where we're really talking about the linkages between pieces on the map. So if you really want to show the linkages between the outputs and the outcomes in a way that text or a logic model doesn't, then I find a concept map can be very helpful. Sometimes I see, um, if you're familiar with Bill Crocom and his concept map systems, he uh, actually combines qualitative and quantitative works in some very fascinating concept map. I know there was a previous um, recording of a session uh, for NCRCRD uh, around ripple map effect, ripple effect mapping. Uh, that would be another uh, cousin of concept mapping that you may want to take a look at. And then the logic model, most of you are familiar with that. That is another tool to be able to actually map what your engaged research looks like. And I change the logic model format when it's simply going to be a research initiative. I'm, if I'm clearly just doing research with the community, and I'm not going to be getting to um, learning or condition or behavior change. I change those last columns for impact to the research columns to say instead um, discover, develop, and disseminate. And that's how um, I tend to change the logic model. Or I will have all six columns, the uh, discover, the develop, disseminate, learn, behavior, and condition, and I'll put all six columns in and try to show what we're trying to do across all of those. So next step after you map it is really kind of determine what it is you're going to research. And sometimes I know we're at the end of this process and instead of the will, we say what has been researched. Sometimes we're creating our map or our, our, our engagement discussion from what we've already done. So what processes and innovations were used in your engaged research? Uh, were you coming up with new ways of working with communities or working with people? Uh, or was the community finding new ways of working with academia? Uh, are there particular ways of doing things or the how that's different, that is really very interesting scholarship to be shared, either in the community or with academic partners or both? Are there some particular products from this engagement research uh, that you really want to report on that shows the impact on individuals or communities or families or regions or organizations if you're working with government entities or non-governmental organizations, might be the products. Or is it that last P of the performance that you really want to talk about, the uh, researcher and the team, or work with communities? Is there something about the performance and working together with communities um, that is really important scholarship to talk about? And so in some ways, this is a little bit about where either the first bullet or the last bullet is where this article I'm working on related to um, the steering committee with communities might fit in as a type of part of the research to talk about. So you can be thinking, oftentimes we're thinking only about the products, but um, I will show an example later, tell about an example later, where really there are many other kinds of ways to share information from the same project. So, what are the potential scholarly products that we might actually be working towards in these steps? Uh, and this is, I have to tell you, actually when I do the national workshops on this, um, are the things people are most interested in. Where are the, are the peer products that um, are, are, we should really be looking at doing to promote our engagement research? We're all familiar with the, the journal articles, uh, especially peer-reviewed journal articles. Uh, conferences, whether they're invited and reviewed posters, presentations, abstracts, proceedings. Again, there's that peer review and the communication and the original work. And then grants uh, and competitive contracts have recently been added to this list of peer products for peer review. Uh, and that, that tends to be something that is really valued, especially if you are um, in a tenure track position uh, and you are going to be going for associate professor or professor. This is one of the high criteria these days. And also I'm seeing literature reviews uh, becoming more and more credible as a peer product. Uh, and it could be meta-analysis as well, might be another piece that goes there. Some people don't think of that all the time as a peer-reviewed product, but it is uh, oftentimes going through that process to be published. Another category of scholarly products are the applied products that those of us doing engagement work uh, find as part of our everyday being. And the scholarly version of this is, again, remember that we're always creating these things, but how do we put it through a peer review process? 
And how do we make sure that it's communicated and that it's original work and that these items are actually qualifiable? So curricula, you've developed other educational materials, guides and manuals, the kind of technical assistance you give, policies and training modules. These are all things that are applied products uh, that can be peer reviewed and can be communicated. And so for example, I think of uh, applied products as well as the next one that I'll be looking at here. It has to do with um, an entity called Community Campus Partnerships for Health, and they define health in a very wide sense. So those of us who are working on human health, community health, all kinds of pieces, we can submit these kinds of products to that group and they will peer review them and help promote them through their website. And so there's a possibility there. So the third kind of scholarly products category that I think of is community products. These are the things we're doing in and with community members, forums, workshops, newsletters, etc. There's probably a very long list of more things here that could be added. And again, these can become scholarly products if you find a way to have them peer reviewed and communicated. And so I think about especially the apps. We've developed several apps in our nutrition and health area in the last couple of years. None of those have been put through a peer review process. They've been communicated, but we could put them through a peer review process because they are our very unique work uh, and actually start to make that happen. And so there's a possibility if somebody were to create through professional associations the review of apps and sharing of that, that they could become scholarly products. So what I hope you can do as you're planning for what it is you really want to measure or how you want to collect and analyze your data or tell your story, that you're thinking about multiple ways to share your scholarly products. And I see that Joseph Donaldson is on, on the line and Joseph um, and I were lucky enough to be part of a Southern SARE project called How Farmers Learn. And it was a three-year project where we spent uh, the first year uh, in Virginia, I was in Virginia at the time, conducting uh, five focus groups with a variety of farmers to ask them how they learn, how they prefer to learn, and what that means for the way we do extension and outreach education. And they also offered as part of that why they want to learn. The second year we conducted those focus groups in Tennessee, so Joseph got involved in Louisiana. And then the third year we set aside to produce products around that research that we had done through focus groups. And we also did some document review and some other things. And we had a steering committee uh, throughout of, of farmers and extension workers and the researchers working together to guide the project. And you can see, because I think we really planned for what our scholarly products would be. In fact, we created a table that listed the actual venue. Was it you know, going to be Journal of Extension? Was it going to be someplace else? Would it be a poster, a conference? Who was in charge of it? Notes. You'll actually see this if you go to um, one of my articles in the uh, in JHEOE. It was uh, printed in 2011. It's actually tips for constructing a promotion and tenure dossier. And there's a copy of the table in there that shows how we did that. But you can see for a three-year project, by the end of three years, we had produced 35 scholarly projects. Uh, there were seven articles that were peer-reviewed. There were six reports that were peer-reviewed. There were in-service presentations that were invited and were reviewed, uh, fact sheets that were reviewed through various processes. Again, the poster presentations, conference presentations, all invited or peer reviewed. A logic model uh, that was used, and it was a research logic model, and a literature review. So all of those were peer reviewed. They were um, original or worked on other people's, off of other people's original work and developed them further, and were disseminated widely in a variety of venues. So you can think about how you can um, plan for uh, working together to share these things. So Joseph, I was going to invite you in the text box if you wanted to add anything else in chat about that process. Thank you for the compliment of working together. I agree. It was probably one of the most magic research projects I have ever been on. Uh, it's just one of those that it would be hard to recreate because of the wonderful people involved all the way from the individuals who attended the focus groups to those of us on the team. And, oh, I agree with you, Joseph. I also grew very much personally and professionally. I learned an awful lot about um, engaged research. I learned a lot about, as you say, their multi-state aspect of working together, and that strengthened it immensely. Uh, so there will probably be time at the end if you want to ask Joseph and I about any um, more pieces about that research. But 
I think that one of the biggest messages and ahas I got from doing that work is that you should really plan for, if you can, from the beginning of a research project, what kind of scholarly products you want to produce and who you want to produce them with. So for example, what we found that was fascinating is the, the farmers and the young uh, professionals that were a part of our research group got very excited about giving conference presentations and poster presentations and in-service presentations. And the extension staff who were field staff also got excited about those and started asking if they could borrow the poster to take it places and um, if we could you know, help them with various pieces. The producers very much wanted to share uh, their experience with the research and the results with their peers at a variety of conferences. So it was, a, it was a real learning experience to learn about a variety of ways to share scholarship. So another step, now we're to kind of step three, that, that, that step two of actually what it is you want to measure and how you want to do it and how you want to tell the story. Step three is collecting and analyzing data. And there are a number of us online who are program evaluators, and so we could give you lots of advice on this, but what I do is I try to boil down this four credit course, actually it's more than that, you could even take a survey uh, course uh, for four credits, uh, down into just five generalizations. I've discovered over the years that these are the five most common ways that we collect data uh, around engagement research. Uh, and I have put them in this order on purpose uh, because I found that case studies tend to be sometimes the richest ways to share uh, our scholarship around engagement, but it is the rarest form used. And so I encourage you to think about how you might use case studies. I find them extremely valuable when you don't have a lot of participants in what you're doing. Uh, and you really want to highlight a particular person or a particular family or a particular business or a particular community organization. I also like case studies because it allows me to tell a more holistic story. Uh, so for example, I worked with um, a 4-H uh, agent in Virginia who I discovered a young man from her 4-H program when I was doing interviews at the state level for awards and trips and said, oh my gosh, this man is amazing. This young man has already done more in his life than most people will ever do because of his involvement in 4-H. And so we chose to um, make him a case study. We interviewed him, we interviewed his mother, we interviewed his pastor, uh, we interviewed his teacher, uh, a coach, with all the same questions about this young man and how 4-H had impacted him and how it had changed his life. And it actually, uh, it was really program evaluation instead of research, but it really gave us some wonderful insights into what is it about the 4-H program that is very beneficial in helping make condition change in the world. He single-handedly had, had changed social conditions for young people in his community. And we're seeing more and more of that. So, Case study is becoming a much more, I think, viable method and a credible method, especially for the work we do with people in the community. Uh, observation is another one that I have been started using more frequently because I, I have not seen it used as much as I think is really important to do so. Oftentimes when we're working with people, um, we know change is happening. Uh, we can actually see before our eyes because we're spending time with them or we're working with people or spending time with them kinds of changes that are happening, but we fail to capture that change using, uh, using other methods uh, because self-report through focus groups, interview, or secondary data or surveys doesn't tell you the why or the how of what's really happening. And so observation can really give you some more insight into the kinds of changes that are happening. And so when I work with engaged uh, research, I'll sit down with a research team ahead of time and really create a rubric for what is it we're looking for if in fact we're going to see certain kinds of things happen with people or communities. And we create a rubric, we go out and we do base observations of what we see in that community, or we train others to do that. I've oftentimes trained young people to do that, to go out and collect that data in their community. We conduct whatever the research is or the intervention is or the process, and then we do the observations again. Uh, on the same criteria, the same rubric, and then we may go out again at certain points, other times, based on whatever the research is collecting and collecting again. So observation can be very helpful for that. I also love focus groups, uh, even more so than interviews, because I find focus groups give you the dynamic of people talking with each other about the phenomenon that you're studying. 
I also, uh, at times, uh, probably bastardized focus groups. Dick Krieger in Minnesota, the, the father of focus groups, would probably not be happy I do this. But I sometimes do quantitative work as part of my focus group because I figure while I have people there, I want to see how prevalent something is. And so I'll oftentimes say, if this is true for you, just raise your hand. And I'm putting down percentages. You know, If there are 10 people in the group, group 90% say this would happen. And if you do have enough people in focus groups over enough sites, you actually would have enough number of people that those that data could be very helpful. Um, I also uh, use secondary data frequently in my engaged research. If someone else has already collected the data, uh, why should I collect it over again? So for example, I see Neil Flores on the line. Um, there's wonderful data that she is helping the Food and Fitness Initiative in Northeast Iowa collect. And I'm using that data to help promote Extension's involvement in the Healthiest State Initiative. Rather than going out and collecting data about Northeast Iowa, why not use the stuff that Neil and her wonderful team has already collected? Uh, one of the pieces that I love is kind of the um, secondary data that's coming in. They have brought in so much money from various sources on their team. And how much have their partners then, in addition, brought in because of their affiliation with the team? And that, that secondary connection data has been very, very helpful. And then last but not least, a way that we oftentimes collect and analyze data in our engagement research is survey or questionnaire, to the point where most of us have had survey or questionnaire death on a daily basis, um, especially Iowa is a swing state. Those of you who are swing state for this last election, one evening I received 12 phone call surveys. Uh, and it was very difficult for me, even though I have a high tolerance because I myself do a lot of survey research, uh, it just gets to be too much. And so I really believe that we have to think very critically as to which method of collecting data is really going to help us get what we need in today's environment. So that's really all about collecting data. There's the other side of this, of analyzing the data. And I have found some really fun things over the years that help me. Uh, one that I just love is conducting a data party uh, in order to bring our partners together to analyze the data. And I started using this um, when I was in New Hampshire. I went to an American Evaluation Association conference and saw a poster by someone who was having data analysis events. And uh, she didn't particularly call it a party, but uh, she had some ideas. And from there, I developed the party piece. And I will have an article coming in the Journal of Extension probably in early 2013 that gives the exact steps on how to conduct those data parties. And what I, I find fascinating is just inviting all the partners, whether it's on your committee, uh, your research team, or a committee of people, or steering partners from the community, or influentials, to come and join you to look at the data and help interpret it. And this is where we came up with the, the, um, the, the single case participatory research, uh, where we discovered in one project I was on where we were doing research in the camp environment and we did a series of focus groups, and we did uh, online surveys through Facebook. It was actually the first online surveys we could ever find being done through Facebook, uh, where we were actually trying to determine what were the transformative aspects of being a 4-H camp counselor as a young adult. How did young people change as young adults due to their involvement in this camp environment? And we had one camp counselor who was a young adult who served on our research team. And by inviting him to be in every aspect of what we were doing, and then he invited in some of the other camp staff to help us analyze the data, it was much more accurate and much more authentic analysis than what those of us who were much older and had um, much more removed experience with the camp environment would ever have had. So I think of the data analysis and involving partners in the analysis as being extremely important. You do have to be very cognizant, though, of you know, validity and reliability and trustworthiness and confidentiality. And so when people do come to the table, we always have a discussion about what it is we can talk about once we leave the room, uh, what kinds of things that we really need to think about as we're working with each other at our next step. And I'm sure you have a million other things you could suggest for data analysis. But those are the some that I find really valuable. Uh, when I worked with Extension in New York, uh, the New York City Extension Office, I did a number of projects with them. And one of the things I love that they did is when they were analyzing their data, they would actually do it in the community if it was a community-based project. They involved whoever their key influencer was. And then they always involved food of some kind. Uh, and that really made a difference for them uh, to have a better environment for doing that kind of work.
I also want to share with you the last step um, that I have in my four steps to engagement research, and it's telling your story. We tend to do a very good job of writing our you know, grant proposals and our research proposals and actually doing the work and collecting the data and analyzing it. But oftentimes, we then stop and we forget to tell the story of what we found. And in some instances, I've found we tend to hire pretty humble people in extension and telling the story feels like we're boasting or tooting our horn. And that's, that's very hard because that's not the way we were raised. And so sometimes it really requires thinking about how can you tell the story in a way that will further the benefits to your community partners uh, or the people you're engaged with. And so in telling that story, it's not boasting about your own achievements, is in fact helping the community uh, go their next step. And so oftentimes, I fully engage the community in helping with the storytelling. They do a phenomenal job. I was doing some um, program evaluation. This wasn't research, but program evaluation on a teen court that I helped to develop when I was with Wisconsin uh, in extension. And all of the young people on this teen court were extremely excited about what they were discovering. It was brand new. We were one of the first teen courts in the country. And I um, had a grant that I was able to take them all out to dinner at the end of the school year uh, because I, I posed it as this was our actual data analysis and reporting meeting. So I bought them all a steak dinner and we all dressed up and had corsages and suits and all kinds of things. And, that was our data analysis. During the, while we were waiting for our food to arrive, I conducted a focus group, and then um, we also did some surveys and things, wire, where we actually put together our story, and those young people, I put together a brief from that, a research brief, and the young people used it in their school paper. Uh, they used it, uh, those who were in 4-H, in their record books. They used it in their application essays for college. Uh, there were millions of ways that I saw how they used the data and the stories from that research brief in ways I never would have thought. So I urge you, when you tell your story, to do it in ways that you can work with your partners to do that. So I always think of these four aspects of telling the story. Have a title that is really going to grab somebody. So we're not going to say something like, Teen Court Conducted in Wisconsin. Well, you know, people don't really care unless maybe they're a youth development worker. But if you're a community development worker, what if the title said something about teen court enhances uh, or, or decreases taxation in Bayfield County, Wisconsin? Now you might read that if you're very interested in the public value aspects of extension work and how we might reduce taxes. Or uh, maybe we might be able to have a title that somehow shows that it reduces recidivism. And then if you're a sociologist, you might be very interested in that. So think of a title for the story you're telling that is going to be compelling for a variety of people, in particular the audience you're looking at. Uh, and, and the relevance then is the next section where you're, you're using some statistics. It's kind of a situation statement. You're using some statistics to tell why this work was important. Then your response, you conducted research with these people in this location, and then the results that you found. Uh, and oftentimes in the results, I make sure that gets tied back into whatever the audience is looking for. So I may use a certain set of results in one publication and another set of results in another. And, and that, that way I'm not plagiarizing, plagiarizing myself. And that is a major issue that we have found has happened recently because number of publications is being privileged in the promotion and tenure process, people are attempting to publish the exact same articles in a variety of places. And that, that's totally unacceptable and unethical. And so you really have to make sure that when you are when you're showing your results, that you're not telling the exact same results in the exact same pieces in every article. So that's just the steps that I use. We could go into much more in depth with all of those. But I wanted to share with you um, a last couple of slides, uh, actually there are five or six or so of them, uh, that talk about um, kind of the bigger context around all of this engagement research and getting it published. The important thing to think about is context is what really matters. And so you need to think about your engagement research and getting it published, that the context that you're going to publish that in is critical in the context you're coming from. So how does your institution's mission align with your research? That's going to be very helpful if you're going to want to publish something that is sponsored by your institution, whether it's an alumni magazine that you're being interviewed for or whatever it might be. Or maybe your department has a peer-reviewed uh, research briefs series uh, that you're a part of. 
You want to think about how your institutions measures of assessment and tenure and promotion fit with your research. You know, and especially if you're going up for associate professor, you want to make sure that the kinds of things your department is looking for, your college and your institution fit the kind of research context that you're publishing in. How does your institution strategic plan mesh? That's another one that if you're going to be publishing within that. What's your academic appointment? I'm 100% extension appointment. The kinds of places that I um, choose to publish will be different than someone who's 100% research or 100% teaching. What's your con contribution to your discipline, department, college, institution? All of those you need to think about as you're positioning your writing. What matters to community partners? So if you have these community um, types of products and you're really looking at, at, at scholarship around uh, displays that you've been putting together that are new and different, what's the, what's the best venue to show that that matters to your partners? Is it having them uh, have photos and put it in their local newspaper? What is it? And what are the issues facing communities that you really want to talk about? What are the issues facing your region? So really all of those contextual things you need to think about in order to have a holistic portfolio of engaged research publications. So now what I'd like to share with you are some tips that I have found over the years uh, that, that I keep adding to as people um, help me realize some things. When you're thinking about publishing your engaged research, start early because engagement takes time. You all know this from the work you do. I think I know about half of the folks online today. And to be truthfully engaged with communities or partners or organizations, it takes anywhere from five to 10 years to really build a very strong partnership. And so oftentimes I don't start from scratch, I start from partnerships that are already in place or join into those that are there. Um, documentation is an ongoing process. Don't wait to uh, all of a sudden um, it's the deadline to get in a publication and you haven't really documented things along the way and you have to recreate them really important as you go along and all of the technology devices we have these days help with this uh, to really take notes every day about the various pieces of scholarship that you want to be a part of so I actually have various little files that as an idea comes to mind I just toss it in there uh, or something that I need to remember to go back to write for a variety of audiences don't write for just one um, I, I noticed that I write very differently uh, for audiences that are community audiences than I do for audiences that are for expansion audiences than I do for um, high academic audiences. Find a balance uh, between process, impact products, and research team quality. Uh, some people oftentimes are focusing just on the process of their research and working together. Some are focusing very heavily on what they want to produce and some are focusing just on the happiness factor and the quality factor of their research team. And yes, you can do that, but I think your productivity and, um, and well-being are higher when you look for an integration, maybe balance isn't the word, maybe integration is a better word there. Be clear about the intellectual question or working hypothesis behind your work. And so uh, when Scott introduced me, he mentioned my research earlier today. I have kind of uh, a couple of working hypotheses or intellectual questions. And my first one that guides most of what I do is, what are the conditions in non-formal learning environments that help um, promote transformative learning? And the second one is, what are the best practices for uh, university uh, engagement, um, uh, measurement, and monitoring, and evaluation, all that impact stuff? So I have kind of the evaluative one and then the learning one. And then that second to the last bullet point, be sure you can tell the significance of any impact that you're showing and how it was determined or evaluated. Oftentimes people say, we found this, and that's it. And, and they don't go any further to really interpret it further for the reader. So it's really important to know how significant is it? What's the depth or the scope? And then how did you find that out? Did you do it through focus groups? Did you do it through work in 25 communities? And then the last one there, the engaged community partnership in publishing as appropriate. So I'm beginning to see now very happily, I, I work with uh, a group of 4-H members and their 4-H uh, agent in Oregon to get published in the Journal of Extension. Uh, we're seeing in the Journal of Community Engagement and Scholarship, they very specifically have, as their mission, they are more apt to accept a, a manuscript if community partners are involved in the manuscript or the work. So we're beginning to see more venues doing that. I'm very pleased to say in the School of Education here where I'm a faculty member, at the PhD students um, 
uh, oral the accounts of their uh, coursework. They're required to have their community partner there that they did their capstone project with. And I find that very refreshing uh, for that, that program in, in my school. So we're seeing uh, some more openness to that. Uh, a couple more tips. Make sure you align your engagement with things. I already kind of mentioned that. Share only the information that supports the research. Oftentimes, as a manuscript reviewer, I am seeing all kinds of things tossed into the discussion section or the findings section or whatever that really is not very focused on um, the research that's being done. And what I will suggest, too, is if you haven't had a chance yet, take a chance to listen to a previous uh, NCRCRD uh, webinar by Dr. Rhonda Phillips. She's the editor of the Community Development Journal, and she shared some wonderful tips and tools about um, being an editor and what is looked for in manuscripts, and she can go into much more depth there for you. But uh, she, I thought, had a very nice overview that supports a lot of this work and also supplements it. Uh, some other tips there are linked to current and past work with your future work so people can see what came out of, where it is, and where it's going. Uh, that's oftentimes seen as kind of in the you know, methodology and then later in the either discussion or conclusions as to future research. Uh, select mentors and learn tips uh, so that they can help you with relationships with publishing. They may already know some editors or journals that will fit your work well. Uh, know and follow the expected format for the publication. I tell you, when people don't follow directions, it drives me absolutely crazy. Don't waste my time. Oftentimes, we'll not even review the whole manuscript if it is so out of whack. I send it right back to the editor and just say, you know, this is just a uh, rejection because it's not following the directions or the format. Uh, get to know editors and reviewers and their expectations because every publication is different. Every editor and reviewer is different. More tips. Create a documentation file system. I mentioned a little bit about mine earlier. Um, develop a, a disciplinary department and national niche. Uh, I oftentimes tell people you're hired into being a uh, extension person because of your discipline. You then become part of the department and eventually we hope you have some type of national niche, especially if you're a campus-based faculty or staff. Uh, publish and present early and often. Uh, that's, I think, good advice, uh, but also make sure it's focused and not just frivolous and don't want it to also look like it's a junket that you're going to Disney World to present. Uh, select service roles carefully and turn them into scholarship. I was very proud of uh, one of our new faculty members here. I asked if he would be willing to uh, serve on the college uh, safety committee. He wrote back and he said, truthfully, I don't see how it connects with what I'm currently doing. I don't have a lab and it wouldn't fit my scholarly agenda, and so it's probably better you ask someone else, and he was absolutely right. Um, make activities that matter a high priority, for example, writing, and demonstrate value in everything you do. If there is something that doesn't feel valuable, try to shed yourself of it if you can, or try to bring some value from it, even if it's simply just networking that will help you with your scholarship. I also just briefly um, want to share a couple more here. Um, I noticed that this list of tips is growing. Every time I do a national workshop, people add more and more for me. Focus is critical. Um, it's very difficult to have your scholarship become published or be known if you're all over the place. Uh, it's very good to have some focus. It doesn't mean that you won't change your topics or see them grow over time. So my scholarly agenda, when I started 30 years ago, is extremely different than what it is right now. It has matured and grown in both scope and depth quite a bit. Try to be new or the first or better than other people. I've mentioned several things in my um, background where I did that. Be aware of what influences your scholarly work and manage it. Uh, this is extremely important. I don't know how often I hear people say, you know, well, I've been given another assignment to do, or, you know, this is what's rewarded in my department, or I don't have time, or I don't have resources. Well, I'm sorry, but that's not right, the right answer. You need to manage that and figure out a way to help that all fall into place for you. And find a way that you can set aside the time to write or to work with community members or whatever it might be. Um, also engage many peer reviewers as you go. Every time I write something, I send it to at least two other people to have it reviewed before I turn it in. And I remember in particular when I was working on my PhD at Cornell, it was about the end of the first semester, and I, my husband was so kind to be one of the people who would read my papers, and he said, I, 
can't be a reviewer for you anymore. And I said, why? He said, because I no longer understand what you're writing about, so you must be learning something. So <laughs> I had to find people who uh, had the academic context who could review for me. And I find that that is invaluable for saving me time, making sure that I am really writing well, and that it is going to make a difference because I'm not writing or publishing my research just for me. I want it to make a difference, and so I want other people to review it and tell me if that makes sense before I send it off to the, the place it's going. Uh, find ways to bridge the gaps between tenure expectations and your actual day-to-day -day research, and oftentimes that's conversation with your supervisor or your department head, or both if they're two different people, to make sure that if there are some conflicts, uh, conflicts can resolve those. And then the final tip there is to reach more than one goal with each activity or project that you have so that you can get maximum products out of each effort. And so again, being planful and thoughtful and mindful about what you hope to get from the activities that you're doing. That you don't simply just continue to work with that same community event every year or group every year. What are some things that you can and the community can get from that work? So finally, just want to say that I hope that you will keep this discussion going in your own realm or realms, whatever they might be. Use each other as a resource. You've had a chance to scroll down the list and see who the wonderful folks are who are here online. Uh, and attend, I would suggest, the National Outreach Scholarship Conference. You can just put NOSC 2013 into uh, a search engine and it will tell you where it is and when it is and how much. That has been the number one best venue I have seen for helping me figure out how to develop my outreach and engagement scholarship and research. Also, I suggest that you remember to celebrate your successes that you have. And, and again, just keep in touch uh, with each other with this scholarship and feel free to also. So, Scott, back to you. Any other questions or comments from the group? I know that you wanted to do your little webinar evaluation pod as well with that. Yep, uh, so I've got that up. If, if people could uh, uh, go ahead and click, at, click in on the appropriate categories there. Uh, thanks very much for a great overview um, of the, the process of developing and publishing uh, this kind of work. Um, what in your mind as you review these dossiers are the, the two or three uh, main ways that people kind of miss when they're they're going up for promotion, you know, opportunities that they may have missed oh, yeah. in the process. That's a great question, Scott. Um, the biggest one that I've seen that I, uh, in all the venues I've been in is, is people really aren't very professional. So if they have poor spelling and grammar and formatting um, or use poor language, uh, you know, that, that is the number one red flag. If that comes to any review partners at all, uh, that's, that really makes it difficult to dig yourself out of the hole. The second one is there's always a narrative uh, that is put together in some places. It's one page, three pages, whatever it might be, a narrative or a philosophy. Uh, and I find that people really miss the boat there when they don't really articulate something cohesive or focused. I do a little bit of this, I do a little bit of that, yada, yada, yada. And it really doesn't tell the story of their engaged research or of their position. And then the other thing that I find is when they have really tried to do something other than the promotion and tenure process in their document. They're trying to prove um, some social justice points, or they're trying to bandstand for a particular part of theory, or they're trying to be in a soapbox about something related to policy. And they're trying to use the promotion and tenure process uh, to, to do something it's not intended for. So those are the three that I, I've seen happen, you know, uh, more frequently than I would like. Uh, and they really aren't about the technique at all. That's more about the bigger picture. Great. Okay, thanks. And, and others, if you've got questions, um, feel free to um, go in and, and uh, put those into the chat box. One other question I had is, uh, I, I didn't go to the link you provided, but I think that's a really interesting link on the, uh, uh, off the engagement and scholarship um, website there, you mentioned uh, the Journal of Higher Education and Outreach and Engagement as uh, sort of your number one most selective uh, journal, and you also mentioned Journal of Extension. Um, are there others that are known for particular 
things where people might uh, think, so if you've got a case study, it's better to go over here, or if you've got more of a quantitative one, it's better to go over there, or you know, are there, are there sort of um, yeah. uh, identities that each of these have had? There are, there are some. And what are some of the main ones? There are some real identities. Um, the Journal of Community Engagement and Scholarship that I mentioned on the University of Alabama, they are extremely interested in the partnership between academia and the community. And so they are more apt to publish things where you're really focusing on the community. In fact, their last issue of the journal, uh, the, the cover was a drawing by a community member. Uh, so that, that's a very applied one. Um, uh, the Journal of Higher Education Outreach and Engagement is something uh, that comes more from the higher, um, oh, I would say, uh, you look at it and you think, oh, it's, it's very similar to a high academic review. Uh, the Journal of Public Scholarship in higher education is just a started they had their premier issue last year and they're really looking at the word public and, and scholarship and so how are we changing public life uh, and then prism p-r-i-s-m is a journal of regional engagement that one is for appalachia so if you happen to be in you know southern ohio uh, you would have a real opportunity there to publish in that one and then there's uh, the Michigan Journal of Community Service Learning. That's great if you have a teaching appointment or you're working with engaged pedagogy or service learning. So, um, you know, they all have their own little niche. Those might be a few that you might find interesting. Okay, thanks a lot. Great, thank you. Good day, everybody. Yeah, I think we've uh, kind of